So I was on Twitter recently and I saw Father Bob talking about the anti-bullying day that we had recently where we're doing campaign throughout the nation and throughout the schools to stop bullying. And he made a reference that our children can't take us seriously about our wanting to stop bullying because of the fact that we're not bringing the refugees here from Manus Island. His implication is that Australia's government and by association all of us are bullies because we keep refugees on Manus Island who were intercepted when they were on our on their way here illegally without permission via boat. There is an ongoing narrative about the way the refugees are treated, the conditions that they're kept under, and the very nature of their not being permitted to come to Australia proper, that suggests that we're treating them with cruelty, with unkindness, with lack of compassion, that there's a, a dehumanisation of those people happening, and in turn this narrative is actually dehumanising the people making those decisions. The immigration minister and the security guards uh, on Manus Island and, and wherever those people are being detained. I do think it's necessary policy. But policy aside, I want to today shatter the narrative and provide a different perspective about the people that work on Manus Island and what's actually going on behind there. What are the people really like there? We need to break the echo chamber by hearing both sides of the argument. And the left side of the argument is well and truly comprehensively covered by the mainstream media. You hear plenty of that. So today we're going to hear from Michael Coates. He's written a book called Manus Days. And in that, he details his experience, his perspective, and his uh, insights into the reality of what's going on there. It is just one perspective. There are many, but it's an important perspective. And we'll hear from Michael in just a minute. Warning, you are now entering a diversity zone where different opinions are tolerated. This is not a safe space. This is Pelo Talk. Michael, welcome to Pelo Talk. Hey mate, thanks for having me on. Thank you very much yeah. for uh, for coming. Make sure the mug's well positioned. It is, yep. It's quite refreshing already. I think you're getting uh, more and more handsome with every sip. Oh, cheers. Well, yeah, it definitely seems to be making a difference. Yeah. <laughs> now, you've written this book called uh, Manus Days, and tell me why you wrote it. Um, it came to, I guess you could say, everyone, I always wondered whether it uh, ever happened, experience that I could write a book about, and it only occurred to me in about maybe early 2015 after the rights, and the, uh, rights of that month, January 2015, where... I was finally sitting down, you know, for about the first time in three days I could actually sit down and go to sleep without worrying about being woken up any minute, that I thought people at home either aren't going to hear that this happened or if they do hear it, it's going to be told by someone like The Guardian who has the actual writers writing articles for them. And that's the only story that's going to come out about this. And pretty much within a few days, that was the story that was coming out. The rioters yeah, yeah. writing articles. Yeah, basically. and um, Which is certainly a biased perspective. Of, yeah, of course it is. But, uh, you know, and um, so, well, yeah. And I thought, well, maybe I should, you know, someone needs to write something that, you know, I wouldn't say giving the true story because it's only a perspective, but yeah, a perspective from the other side. They it's the truth to the best of your yeah, knowledge and ability. The, the right? truth to me and to my friends that uh, experienced it, and what we saw and experienced, and yeah, to give our perspective of you know a voice that's not really heard much about. Because a lot gets said about oh, giving a voice to the voiceless, but this voiceless they're talking about have pretty much every left wing media source available to them yeah. to tell it and it was our voice that never got heard and yeah. I just yeah thought it was time that maybe yeah, people heard the other side of the story the, tell me about well, we certainly want to hear about the exceptions mm -hmm. and I guess the other side of the story to, to what the leftist narratives will, will often tell us but I actually want to start with the people that you liked tell yeah. me about the people you know how many of the transferees were genuinely nice, genuinely needy, 
um, people that you felt a, a deep amount of compassion and, and protect, protectiveness towards. Well, you see, I'd, I'd, I'd even I'd make even more of a distinction between people's say. There was no way you could know a hundred percent, despite what people are telling you about what their background is. And but day to day, you know, someone could be hiding the absolute worst, worst background imaginable from you. But if that deal with you personally, respectfully and courteously, like you're not going to have a bad relationship with that person. Mm. On the same token, someone could be the most genuinely unique person in the world. But if they treat you like dirt and speak to you like you're dirt, mm. you're not going to get on very well with that person. And that's pretty much came down to, you know, treat people how you expect to be treated, which people like to band around a lot. But yeah. people haven't actually really tried had to live it a lot of the time. They can pick and choose who they deal with. And so how many of the detainees would treat you, sorry, transferees, yeah. <laughs> would uh, treat you and the other security guards and, and um, centre staff with respect and courtesy well, and cooperation? Most, most people you deal with on a day-to-day basis would. You know, people, an average person going along about their life every day doesn't have any reason to be antagonistic towards you at every given moment. You'd have a few that would... You know, that's not saying that everyone would be seeking you out to interact with you every moment of the day. Mm-hmm. And there was some that, you know, that you might get a scowl from every time you walk past. But by and large, day to day, it was groups of people going about their life. So, yeah. And tell me about the people who then did right. Was there a pattern of behaviour from them before and after that distinguished them from there the, was, the majority? Um, there was... Definitely the ringleaders and the ones you could you could be certain were involved and that yeah, it was right and they seemed to be an annual thing, which was weird. It always happened about January or February every year. Hmm. Uh it was meant to be December in uh that instance, but uh we're getting all the indicators are going to ride again that year, but the whole thing cafe siege happened and uh wasn't much was much time for Iranian asylum seekers in the media, so they put it off for a bit. At that time, so yeah, that, that so yeah. that's that's suggesting these weren't stimulated by genuine needs or circumstances, oh, but rather by yeah, it was a new it was because every riot was always, of course, yeah, it was always being coordinated with you know media attention, and you know you could tell that they'd be monitoring the media, just the same that we'd be monitoring the media out of interest about what's being shown and um, how things were being reacted to in the media would then shape their actions. So in a way, yeah, you could, you know, both sides could be using the media as a tool really to learn more about what the other was. You know, the whole time during that riot in 2015 where basically half the centre was shut down and inaccessible to us, mm. the way we knew about what was going on inside because we had no way of seeing what was happening inside and there were, of course, threats that there was going to be mass, mass self-harms, which I say in inverted comments because it wasn't going to be self-harms as far as we were concerned. It was going to be something could possibly be murdered to make a point. The only way by the by the transferees themselves that uh, the way we knew what was going on inside was by looking at their Facebook accounts, basically, because they were putting up photos of what they were doing inside. So you know, wow. it was, yeah, it was a way of us to sort of get a bit of inside uh, intelligence, I guess you could say, about what we're going to be dealing with when we do go. Be careful what you put on Facebook. Yeah, that's it. Eh? <laughs> yeah, could come back and bite you. So tell me, um, how much did you get to know, as you interacted with the transferees, how much did you get to know about their life immediately and significantly before their arrival at Manus? Um, it, it cha- for me personally, it changed a lot. Uh, in the early few months I worked there, the first couple of uh, rotations I did, I did get to know some, some transferees there pretty well. Afterwards, I moved into a role that was more involved in the uh, emergency response side of the house. So uh, the way I was able to interact changed. Obviously, people became a lot more standoffish and didn't have as much opportunity for me personally to get to know people the same way because um, obviously people that were more inclined to be troublemakers in the centre didn't want to buy from me. So, yeah. Was there a lot of um, exchange of discussions and intelligence of different people's backgrounds even if you didn't personally uh, obtain the information uh, amongst the, your peers, your colleagues, yeah, yeah, we definitely knew a lot of a uh, lot of uh, whether it was uh, 
hard information and gossip, but we definitely knew a lot about our same way they knew a lot about us, you know. Often they'd approach you and say, oh, how's such and such going, you know, because, you know, we can look at their Facebook account, they can look at ours. So they knew just as much about our you lives. You lock it down so they couldn't? It was locked down as far as, as much as you know, but people right. always find out, you know. Wow. I still get Facebook requests from them now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, guys back in their home countries and that, so... So they actually do go back. How many of them are heading back home? Well, um, I'd say in my time when I first got there, there was about 1,300 in the centre. And by the time I left, there was close to maybe 700. That's really great. So it's a, re- a fair, and like, I don't know exactly the numbers of you know returning home as opposed to being sent elsewhere, but I, could, I can definitely say it was a weekly occurrence that they were, there was a busload leaving from the airport at least once a week. Mm. Yeah. So tell me about the the ones where you thought these guys aren't genuine, where you found out about what they'd been doing in, in the years or months prior. Well, the main thing is um, the first thing is you get there and people, your impression would be that everyone who's a you know, refugee in a refugee camp is fleeing a war or something. And for a lot of especially from people from countries like Iran, you know, it might not be, obviously you hear a lot about the Iranian government and that, but it's a, not a country that is a war zone. So straight away it's like, oh, okay, well, it's definitely not a direct war that's been played here. And it's definitely not a war on Australia's doorstep that's been played. It's on the other side of the world. But you start to bit, and then obviously the first thought would be, well, obviously they are fleeing some sort of oppression or persecution for whatever reason. Um, and a lot of you know a lot of things are said. It could be due to you know, homosexuality or converting to Christianity or something. But then you'd start talking to people, and you'd start getting this other sort of story where you'd be thinking, "Oh, wait a minute, what's what's this?" Like when someone's like, "Oh, I just had to leave. I had to leave because the police were constantly harassing and harassing my family." It's like, "Oh, boy, I was selling drugs out of my car at university." You're like, <laughs> well. Really? Yeah, okay. And you're like... That was a so real that, one? That was an actual... Yeah, that was one. And then... <laughs> or I killed a guy at a fight in a nightclub and my dad wouldn't bail me out. Because, you know, his dad was in politics and was sick of dealing with, with it. And I'm just like... A nightclub where? Uh, in Dubai, actually. And, yes. and I was like... So you start thinking, well, are we talking about persecution or prosecution of people? All right? And then you hear about, you know... And obviously, you know, you hear about, you know, them coming to Australia by boat. The boat doesn't leave from Iran, obviously. The boat leaves from uh, Indonesia or Thailand. Then you start hearing the stories about the 12, 18 months in Thailand beforehand, partying with uh, Westerners and getting this maybe impression of uh, Western life being like this really, you know, Mm. stuff that you had to do, you know, behind closed doors in Iran apparently is just, and, you know, the decadence that a Westerner lives in when they go to Thailand and they see that and go, oh, well, it's an alternative, and obviously you've got you know people smugglers that are selling that dream to people, mm. and you start wondering about you know, and I'm only talking about the Iranians and stuff I've dealt with here, but you start getting the impression that the people that are taking that that ticket, you know, might have a bit more in their background that is maybe not as uh, romantic as say an advocate might want to think about. So there'll be plenty of people watching who want me to ask if you're a racist because you seem to observe a pattern amongst Iranians mm. as opposed to the Rohingyans and other refugees that, that might have been there. Do you have any particular ill feeling against Iranians? Didn't really give them much thought beforehand and, well, I definitely had ill feeling towards those Iranians because of the constant attacks you would suffer from them and the abuse that you would see them heap not only on you but on local New Guineans that were accommodating them and the other races that were accommodated at the centre. So, uh, yeah, people can call me that if they want. But So the New yeah. Guineans actually provided, did they provide cleaning services and cooking? Absolutely everything, uh, except for a brief period um, in early 2014 there was no local staff in the centre because of the riots. Uh, but once that all settled down, they were reintegrated completely back into the operations. There, yeah, um, the locals provided. And they weren't treated with respect. Uh, not by a, and 
again, generalization, you know, some Iranians probably were quite, you know, respectful to them, but day in, day out, you would see, yeah, them abusing them. Uh, yeah, in the case of the cleaners, making mess for them to clean up. On the other hand, though, there was obviously um, some behind the scenes, there was a big, uh, say, black market going on between them as far as trading and that went. So there was definitely a relationship of necessity in that. Yeah. And in was that, that sense, yeah. was that a black market in contraband? Uh, well, um, funnily enough, yeah, just c- that cigarettes. Oh, well, yeah, that cigarettes were supplied quite liberally to transferees there, which I always found a bit weird because it was like, you know, technically, I guess, Commonwealth establishment, you'd think smoking wouldn't be encouraged, but yeah, they were. So cigarettes became pretty much the local currency there because obviously the cigarettes being quite expensive for the locals and pretty much freely provided for the transferees. So cigarettes became the um, the currency for anything from okay, sex so to the transferees to, would get cigarettes for free and use that to pay the locals for... Uh, they, they, well, they purchased them using a point system, but yeah, it wasn't something that had to be earned. It was basically if you, were, if you attend activities and stuff in the centre... Uh, you'd be given points to purchase things from the canteens and said it was a way, I guess, of encouraging people right. to, you know, uh, just be active mm. during their time there. Something, you know, which I don't think anyone can argue would be a good thing. And, uh, but yeah, obviously those, that was used as a, uh, currency to get anything really, yeah, from the locals that, and yeah, they could get basically anything, anything that the locals could get their hands on definitely ended up in the centre. Mm. Yeah. Now, were the transferees um, locked in this compound with razor wire around no. the top? Um, something I always find really frustrating to look at and see is, yeah, people talk about, yeah, behind barbed wire. No barbed wire whatsoever. Nothing like that. Like, yeah, what what, I don't, was, the, I don't, what yeah. was the facility inside and outside like? Well, if we're just talking about the fence, in the early days, it was barely more than a freaking chicken fence that wouldn't stand up to a gust of wind really uh the fences did get improved over time but and the center could be locked for safety reasons but it wasn't you don't you know the gates always remained open they, they might be closed to uh you know give access to vehicles driving down the road so you didn't have a giant gate blocking off the road but they were never locked there was nothing to stop them walking out and just walking down the road, which they often did. Obviously, you know, outside they don't have the uh, protection of being in the centre and uh, under the local PNG jurisdiction, which, yeah. So, yeah, they had that to contend with if they were to walk out of the centre. Yeah. Was that a problem? Why would they have something to fear from the locals? Or, uh, well, or the local a large, authorities? well, not all of them did, but coming back to the uranium problem again, uh, especially after the first riot in 2014, they did absolutely nothing to endear themselves to the local population and local police. So there certainly wasn't a great uh, great desire to run into the PNG authorities outside the, outside the centre. How big is Manus Island? Um, it's, it, well, it's actually a province. Like, it's a massive chain of islands. The, lot, the largest island, the main one, that was almost called uh, Los Negros. Um, about 50,000 people living there all up. Probably even more now. So uh, yep. there was a lot of people actually immigrating from the mainland because of all the job opportunities that the centre there was bringing. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's not a tiny little. wasn't a tiny little backwater. So it wasn't a, a village with twenty seven people in it. It's a a large. Well, no, no. Well, when I say fifty thousand. Now spread over the whole island. Like mm-hmm. you know, you, I was. It's not like you'd see fifty thousand people in one place, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you'd um everywhere you go there was houses. You know, inside. You know. All around the place, so, so it's, it's not a, a tiny a developed area with shops and yeah. Obviously, you know, it's it's not a metropolis, but it's not a it's not a backwater either. I was yeah. actually quite surprised. It's a pretty comparable to an average Australian country well, town. I guess so. it actually reminded me a bit of um, a less developed sort of Vanuatu. If you've been there, when I went to Vanuatu um, recently, it was sort of reminding me a lot of Manus. Right. Funnily enough. Okay. It's like almost Manus could become a Vanuatu, you know, yeah. if, if that sort of road. And so the transferees could come and go from the centre as they want, mingle and interact with the Yeah, villages. absolutely. And, um, could they get jobs or anything like that if they want? Uh, later on down the track, when the resettlement process did start, a second centre 
was opened closer to Lorengau, which is the capital of the island, which was a different setup again. This was uh, for transferees that have now become what they termed residents that had been um, deemed to be refugees eligible to settle in PNG. And part of that process was, you know, they left the transit centre. I mean, sorry, they left the processing centre and moved into the transit centre and began a process, which I think was due to last about six months or so, you know, learning about integration and uh, getting upskilled and stuff. And yeah, and they were basically right in the middle of town and they were it was sort of like their introduction to living in PG, you know, and what was said about, oh, you know, they're forcing them to live in this remote community. It's like it wasn't ever meant to have them living in Manus. It was just where the process was going to be uh, started before they moved on to. Sure. And then there were stories, yeah. Um, transferees or residences that became then, yeah, getting jobs on the mainland in uh, Lay or Port Moresby mm. and then moving on and then uh, in some cases returning because they didn't like the jobs they had or, yeah. Has Manus Island been shut down or just that centre? The young processing centre, yeah, uh, that I spent most of my time is, is gone now. Yeah, so I saw photos of the site the other day, it's been basically bulldozed. Wow. Um, and uh, anyone So there's else? nobody left there anymore? No. Now, they have moved into um, new centres on the outside of town, but I would very little do with uh, Australia. To your knowledge, why did people not want to leave that processing centre for the new one? I, I understand yeah. everything was provided for them. Cooking, I, cleaning, accommodation, I comfort. Can, I, can only, I can only guess, but based off what I saw... When the first transit centre in Warringah opened, um, a lot were a lot that were deemed eligible to relocate there wanted to at first, and then went there and then came back when they realised once they moved there they weren't going to be cleaned up after they weren't going to be catered for in the same way they were still going to get a allowance from the government to buy everything they needed, mm. but it wasn't being cooked for them, it wasn't being provided for them, and they were just decided to move back. They had to integrate and be self-sufficient yeah, to a certain much. extent, yeah. to a small extent. And uh, But those that did decide to leave there, uh, to move in there and take advantage of that, funnily enough, said, uh, we hope they don't come because those guys will wreck it for us when they do turn up. So they were quite happy to have a lot of them remain back in the original process and so on. What are some of the... Pick, pick a couple of memories from the book that... I'm sure there's lots in there, um, and people should definitely buy it to to read all of them. But um, just pick a couple of the kind of stories that um, aren't really well told in in the mainstream media when it's inconvenient to the narrative that Australia is bullying these poor poor people. Yeah, I just sort of the thing that things that always stuck out to me was watching the way, say. That people back home via the media could be manipulated into thinking certain events were unfolding. Like when you watch, and when you watch videos of transferees, which you know I look at them, I recognise those transferees immediately as the wrong leaders of the right because I watch them leading the right, and they stand against the fence, going, "Oh, we're you know, you know, begging to the camera, you know, help." Australia, you know, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we have no food. This is during the uh, the hunger strike? Oh, during the hunger strike, yeah, which was happening concurrently to the riots, uh, just on the other side of the centre. If you didn't didn't want to riot, you got in on the hunger strike, but standing there going... Something for everybody. Yeah, yeah, just uh, just turned out what side you were on, uh, what side of the uh, centre you were on. But um, ironically, the side that was hunger striking was the side of the centre that rioted the year before and probably said, yeah, we're not doing that again because they didn't end very well. And the side of the centre that right the next year were the ones that didn't get involved the year before, so they probably hadn't seen the consequences of what happens when the local police come over the fence. So, uh, but yeah, when they stand, you know, they stand there pleading, going, "Oh, you know, we're hungry, we're thirsty," and it's like, "I'm st- I'm standing here, I'm standing here watching them, and there's pallets of water, and there's taps there, and there's food, and the only reason the mess isn't open is because." They are throwing rocks at the caterers and the caterers can't bring food in. It's been deemed too dangerous. And they are actively preventing food getting in, which is, you know, in effect, denying food to all the people living in the compound that don't want to be involved in this. Mm-hmm. But, uh, 
Yeah, and then people back home are like, oh, this is horrible. What are we doing to them? So nothing's, we're not doing anything to them. We are literally trying to bring them food and they're attacking us. So, and then, yeah, the hunger strikes was just to have a, the hunger strikes could be described as nothing more than a complete farce. Um, to be on a hunger strike officially there, which is what we refer to officially as an FFR, food and, uh, food and fluid refusal. Um, basically, there was a mess, uh, a mess hall in every compound and you know, transferee attended each, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner. None got ticked off a book. So, you know, because if a transferee was to miss more than maybe, you know, one or two meals a day, then, you know, someone would go check on the welfare, see how they're going. Mm-hmm. So during this period, suddenly... Sounds like they yeah. weren't closely monitored or supervised oh. on an individual basis. No, not really. Like, yeah, it could, it could be, unless you knew them quite well, it could be a nightmare to try and track down one individual person. Wow. Yeah, you'd, uh, on the occasion, I did have to do that. You'd, uh, not the gulag that we've been depicted by left-wing media. Oh, no. It was, yeah, no, we couldn't even legally search their rooms, you know. So... There was, so there was no surprise at all when all the homemade weapons came out during the riots because we knew they were under their beds with a sheet over them that they knew that we couldn't, and there was no convenient, and there was no mm. uh, coincidence either that all the fans were suddenly missing fan blades. So, but, but uh, getting back to the hunger strike, it was um, so yeah, during that whole period, obviously no one's eating in the mess tent or the mess hall, depending on what uh, what compound it was in. So, yeah, on paper, no one's eaten in weeks. So, oh, God, they're not eating. But that doesn't take into account all the food out of the canteens that they can buy. So you'd be, I'd be walking around their accommodation areas and seeing them sitting there eating packets of shapes or two-minute noodles or chocolate and then walking out to the front gate where all the cameras were and, oh, collapsing on the ground from hunger and all the mates crying and screaming and getting stretched off. And it's just, and we are just like, it started off just being a joke, really, and then, but then get to the point where it's like people in Australia are marching in the streets. Well, oh, that's the impression that we got from the media. Might have only been 50 people outside the town hall in Brisbane or whatever. Yeah. But, but that was egging them on too because they see that and they talk to the activists online and they say the whole country is rallying behind you. And so I think well about, motivated but naive people. Oh, well, in, in, most, in, in most cases, I'd say well meaning, in some cases. No, I'd say probably not as well meaning really, but sure. um, but you know, encouraging it really that you know, and that's not that they're you know, no one there was ever in any danger of starving. That's just ridiculous. But just to carry on in that way mm. and see other characters. I remember one character in particular. I always had him photographed in a wheelchair, saying he hadn't eaten in four months or whatever. And I'd see him every day playing soccer, running around. So. <laughs> And but any suggestion that this could be maybe not genuine or staged, it's sort of like there's a lot of actors who can't even get that through their head. That's just the most horrible thing to suggest that, you know, why would they? Why would they? It's like, well, why wouldn't they? They've been denied, you know, rightly or wrongly, they've they've been ripped off. So because there's a reward for been, acting yeah. like spoiled children. Yeah, well well they're under the impression that there could be. Mm. And that's probably because in the past it probably has been rewarded in ways. Mm. And uh, so they're being encouraged to behave in that way. Mm. And, you know, obviously behaving in that way is preferable to rioting, you know, because sure. it's, not, it's nothing worse than annoying, really. Mm. But, you know, when I'm having to spend days and days in the hot sun carting these people back to the medical centre, which is then overflowing with people that aren't hungry but are acting like they're unconscious, mm. and then... Having to eat my own meals outside next to the bin because our own mess has been turned into a second medical centre because it's the only large enough structure that they can then be moved into mm. while they're all sitting there laughing at us. It's like you don't, you don't really get a. Good, so you mentioned you have to there. get a search warrant. You had to. You weren't allowed to search their. So you mentioned that you're not allowed to search their rooms. No, not all. Yeah. But um, there was one time, at least in, in your book, where you mentioned that you did search somebody's room. How does that, how do you get permission? Uh, searches, those searches were actually warrants conducted by the PNG police that we just assisted with. So if okay. there was, so there was, we could request, of course, the PNG police to conduct a search warrant on based on intelligence that we provide for them. That was very, very slow in coming and, you know, 
only happen once in a blue moon, really, if they had a reason to want to do it themselves. So it doesn't sound like the PNG legal system was trying to persecute these guys either. It seemed like oh, I think, well, the local, local police didn't just didn't really care. Like, what was happening right. inside the centre wasn't affecting uh, their beat. So you could see Not on their the problem. outside. So, yeah, a lot of time it wasn't. Um, obviously, after the riots, we you know, was, yeah, ma- very large warrants conducted, and that's where we found a lot of... Uh, well, what was left, you know, most most of the weapons obviously had come out by then, so we didn't. Need, we still found more, but mm. you know, several years of stockpiling and uh, wow. Yeah. And um, tell me about what you found in one particular gentleman's room. Uh, there was, you know, I guess what yeah, what you call child pornography was found with a few transferees. Um, a few, a, f- a few, like when I'm saying a few, a handful. Of, but and it wasn't really a new discovery. They were people that had been sort of suspected, had been caught, you know, a few times, say downloading stuff in a internet cafe there and uh, in the town or in the centre. In the centre and uh, also in the town, wherever they did go into town, Sounds they like were very to comfortable be, gulag. Yeah, yeah, you know, obviously, you know, Wi-Fi can get a bit slow when everyone's downloading movies at once, but uh, you know, it's not a yeah, it's what you make of it there, but. With regards to the yeah, those certain individuals would have to follow them around town when they did go into town, keeping a distance, of course, because you couldn't be seen to sort of harassing them or impeding their movement, but uh, making sure they didn't have any contact with local kids, not just for the kids' safety, but theirs as well, because uh, if something was to happen to some local children in town, you can just imagine uh, the whole village turning up with pitchforks and machetes mm. and uh, us being caught in the middle of it, so we weren't too keen for that to come back on us either. The relationship between the transferees and the locals, there's some reports that there's a fair bit of um, animosity, resentment between the locals and that that the transferees are afraid afraid to leave. So the some certainly are and in that case a lot of it can be put down to it's they're reaping what they've sowed in they antagonised, and once again, I'm talking about the troublemakers here, but they antagonised the locals to the point where it's almost, a, and you know, it's almost as if they forget that, you know, the locals that work in the centre live in the community. What? And they know exactly who they are when they go into the community. The locals know yeah. which are the worst, so it's not a well, universal they, treat, bad treatment of. No, no, they knew, and not all, friends. and you know, there were some locals, you know, that married local women and had kids there, yeah. and that. Did quite well as far as I could see. Yeah, they integrated into the local community when they did go out and about. So, yeah, and um, yeah, but those those that did have reason to fear the locals had a reason, and you know, a lot of it came down to their own prior behaviour and the fact that probably emboldened by the fact that we didn't have any power to do anything to them, and they basically just. Got away with everything scot free in the centre, but there's different rules when you step outside the gate. Obviously, and they weren't really prepared for that. How frequent was it that the transferees would have good relationships with the locals? Oh, I'm sure a lot more frequently than I even really took notice of. But like I said, you know, there was uh, I knew of a few that married local women and had families. So well, that it sounds was, fairly yeah, friendly. Yeah, it was definitely, and obviously when you. Um, Two-sided coin, obviously they got quite involved with trading and probably the local, uh, not that Manus would be considered like a crime hotspot, but the local, you know, the local uh, crime, crime did become, was something they did become involved in, which probably was quite troubling. I'm sure more than a few problems that they had in the local community were involved, uh, say, you know, debts to local loans and stuff like that they became involved with. What what are you hoping your book will accomplish in the minds of the average Australian? The only thing I ever really wanted to come out of it was just to be able to tell my friend's story and I, but what we experienced, and I guess it's something that everyone heard a little bit about in the background, but no one really ever uh, got any real, real first-hand accounts of. And the first-hand accounts that did come out what I saw of it, you know, not outright lies, but very uh, 
very biased and very uh, what I'd use would be um, sort of cultivated in a way to uh, appeal to a certain audience that's going to that's going to run with it. You know, you could accuse me of being the same. You know, and I'm yeah, I'm biased towards my own personal experience. You know, my own personal experience is my absolute truth, and that's all I've got to sort of offer. And I just hope that people, whether they agree with it or not, can see that there is a certain there is another side to the story. Mm. How many of your former colleagues on from Manus have read your book? Uh, well, a lot. I showed most of them before. Uh, when I first started writing, it. so I okay. was happy to. And theirs was the only opinions I really sort of cared about. Were there mixed good. responses? Uh, it, well, they've been good so far. So uh, nobody's had a particular problem with any perspective or. or no, the way if, 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 if if anything, it's just made me um, made me wish I'd known more things that went on because exactly it was only like talking to them afterwards that people were able to add about oh. Did, you know, about this and this, and, I, and you know, I'm still finding out things these days. Like, I didn't even know that was going on. Right? You'll have to do a second edition with heavy yeah, quotes from feels like, it feels like it, eh? Hey? Like, I was, I was just talking to one the other night, and like, yeah, some of the things he told me about certain characters in the book that are just things I didn't even know about, and it just makes me wish I had beforehand because it would have made it a lot more interesting. So, the book is called Manus Days by Michael Coates. You can get it from Connor Court and all good bookstores. Michael, thank you very much for coming on Pillow Talk. Thanks, man.